Islamic authority is essentially Saudi Arabia for all the rest of the so-called Muslim world. Our own intelligence agencies churn out terrorists, fund and train terrorists, arm terrorists. Well, the Quran is a divinely coded scripture, sacred instructions straight from our creator. Well, my name is Amanda Rose Reed, like you read a book, R-E-A-D. Yeah. Um, and how many years did I serve in the military? Uh, eight. Eight years active. I grew up primarily in north central Missouri. I grew up between Kansas City, Missouri and a little town called Trenton, Missouri. About 6,000 and some change population. So on my father's side, we are Mayflower descendants. We're also distant relatives of Benjamin Franklin by way of his marriage to Martha Reed Franklin, which, ironically, she was deathly afraid of the water and did not accompany him to England. Um, we're all pretty good swimmers. Uh, my mother's side, not quite sure. She was adopted, Catholic orphanage in early 60s in Nebraska. We've got like some DNA stuff, and they've unsealed some of the information, so we've been able to... Um, contact a few distant relatives, but there's really not much on my mother's side that I'm aware of. What were your parents like? Uh, well, my mother and my father divorced when I was about eight. My dad, Larry, he's, um, I guess he would describe himself as a roughneck biker hippie. Something. I mean, he's, you know, he's the type of work, my father's an intelligent man, type of work he's done is, um, you know, like masonry work, construction, stuff like that. Um, he's a nature guy, he's like the beast master. So, um, and there's a bit of a background in Wicca with him and uh, cousin on his side. Um, and my mother, very intelligent woman, um, was a she's a retired registered nurse. She worked in the emergency room at our local hospital for most of my life. Um, she's also a forensic death investigator. Um, she let us watch all the scary movies and read all the scary books. And um, not a religious woman, um, secular. I do know that she believes in God, but she never really spoke about it. Um, her she was adopted, so her adopted mother. My grandma, Birdie, converted to Jehovah's Witness, I think, when my mom was in high school, middle school or high school. So that was pretty traumatic for her. No, all of a sudden, no more birthdays, no more Christmas. Um, which it makes sense why they, why they do that, but culturally for her, like all her friends are getting Christmas and birthdays and, you know, that ended for her. So um, my mother was always cool about not making us go to church or not making us read the Bible or allowing us to go to services with friends or something if you wanted to. Um, when my mother remarried, my stepdad's pretty much the same. Kind of like my dad, redneck, biker hippie. He's a Navy veteran. Um, also secular, not religious at all. Um, so you grew up in like a, just a, a non-religious home? Right? Yeah, I was non-religious um, in, in our immediate home, um, my grandma Birdie obviously would drag us to the Kingdom Hall. Uh, we would spend time on her little miniature pony ranch in Oklahoma when she had that. We spent a lot of time at the Kingdom Hall in Drumright, Oklahoma. And um, so that obviously caused some tension in the family. Yeah, you mentioned that you had uh, a debate with your grandma. Yeah. She kind of set you off to be this lifelong or early lifelong atheist. <sighs> What was that about? Yeah, so one of uh, one of my visits, one of my childhood visits to the Tiny Acres Ranch, formerly, um, just outside of Drumright, Oklahoma, my grandmother raised Appaloosas, and she had some show ponies, and um, so my sister and I would be out there, and um, I remember Grandma would always have like the Watchtower and all various you know literature and. Um, Jehovah's Witness paraphernalia laying around the house and she was always wanting to talk about God and I must have been like seven eight years old um, 
I forget which of the Nine Inch Nails albums I was listening to. Um, was it the Downward Spiral or the Pretty Hate Machine? I don't recall. But anyway, um, Grandma Birdie starts talking to me about God, and I asked her, I said, what about a guy who's like on a remote island or like somewhere in the rainforest and he's never heard of Jesus, he's never had access to a Bible, he never um, received a missionary, he, he knows nothing about your religion. What about him? Does he go to hell? And she said, yes. And I asked why. It doesn't seem fair. And she said, because God knows who deserves to be saved and who doesn't. So right then and there, I quoted Trent Reznor, your God is dead and no one cares. If there's a hell, I'll see you there. And I was just a little girl. <laughs> yeah. but that's what I was listening. And then I walked out of the house. And I went down to the pond and watched the, watched the frogs while I continued to listen to some Nine Inch Nails. And she was pretty um, upset by that, if you can imagine. Yeah. I said something like that in her house. <laughs> what were you like as a teenager? What were your teenage years like? Mm. Rowdy. Rowdy. I was a smart kid. But I had, um, see, we lived in Kansas City for some time. And so the curriculum in a metropolitan area versus a curriculum in a small town, essentially Amish country. Jamesport's like 12 miles outside of Trenton. So we've got a lot of horse and buggy Amish and Mennonites up there. So I was bored. This is in the 90s, early, mid-90s. Um... This is the Bible Belt, the Corn Belt, the Bread Basket. So I joke that there's a church and a meth lab on every corner up around there, at least back then. Um, so a lot of people were getting into speed. Um, that was the speed in cannabis, obviously, but speed mostly. And so, you know, a lot of people I went to school with were using and getting strung out and you know, typical rural upbringing, you know, bonfires. But what was that Alan Jackson song? Went down yonder on the chat. <laughs> anyway, pyramid of cans in the pale moonlight. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole, you know, just kids down at the river with a bonfire, drinking beer, smoking pot, you know, maybe dropping some acid here or there. Um, but then things started to get serious when people started to get strung out on methamphetamine. And then people started to get busted. <laughs> and then they have their drug task force, which war on drugs is a joke, but, you know, so there was a lot of that. So a lot of, you know, like, uh, drug task force snitch activity, you know, older guys turn out younger girls with meth and purple passion. And then they, you know how that, you know how that works with the drug task force. Like they got to keep themselves gamefully employed. So they'll pick people up and put them back out to go snitch or whatever. So there was a lot of that going on with high school kids. And I remember a bunch of my friends in high school got busted for various things, having Ritalin, uh, cannabis. Um, and boy, they were real proud. That drug task force was real proud of busting all them teenagers. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got these other people out here turning the teenagers out, and they're not worried about them. I remember sitting in an apartment with my friend who had been shooting up, and it was like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I knew my mom was working at the hospital because um, she worked graveyard shift in the emergency room. And I remember sitting there, like, I think I was maybe only snorting or smoking, and I remember thinking to myself, like, this is not the life I want to live. Like, half my friends are knocked up. The other half, the males are strung out on something, you know, in and out of jail. Their rap sheet's growing day by day. You know, my parents didn't necessarily have money for me to go to college. Um, and so I had called my mother from the hospital. I didn't think I needed rehab, but I was like, I needed to get out of here. So I called my mom, and I was like, hey, mom. I think I'd like to go to rehab. And I had already moved out of my parents' house by this time. I was like 16. And um, so I ended up going um, a short stint in rehab. And then a few months later, I joined the Navy. Because when I got home from rehab, I was just like, there's nothing in this town for me. I needed to go somewhere else. And I looked into Peace Corps, Job Corps, student loans, all kinds of things. And there was a gal that I had gone to high school with who was uh, ROTC, Army. And 
I spoke with her a little bit. She came over with a recruiter. They sat down, spoke with my parents. They got up to leave, and the moment they shut the door, my stepdad, who's a Navy veteran, said, um, you don't want to join the Army, you want to join the Navy. And I was like, why? He said, well, do you want to sleep in a ditch every night, or do you want to sleep between some clean sheets every night? And I said, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm joining the Navy then. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, because I had a lot of interests. Um, so I, I had joined the Navy as an undesignated deck seaman in 1998, October 1998, October 19th, actually, 1998. Um, when you join, um, they ask you about your orders, where you would like to be stationed. And I put, they give you three, three options, and mine were always as far away from here as possible. And so the Navy delivered. I was originally, well... Start with boot camp. Boot camp, boot camp was funny. <laughs> boot camp was funny. Boot camp's about two months, or at least it was then, in what we refer to as Great Mistakes. It's Great Lakes, Illinois. So it was like mid October when we got there, and so we graduate at the end of December, and so it's super super cold, and because this is like Chicago weather, right? The windy city. So Great Lakes is right next to it, and it's every bit as cold. Um, so you don't really know what the Navy's really like because you're in boot camp. After boot camp, um, I had originally received orders to the John F. Kennedy, which is an aircraft carrier out of Norfolk, Virginia. And while I was home on leave after boot camp, I received an emergency change of orders to the USS Arctic out of Earl, New Jersey. That was a fast combat support ship. And so I reported to the USS Arctic and early January of 1999, not quite 18 years old. I didn't turn 18 until later, a few months later, but <laughs> bottom of the rung, seaman recruit. Um, I was out there hauling Warren lines and shimmying down anchor chains to chip and paint. And um, this was at the tail end of Kosovo, so our first, my first deployment came a few months later. Like, we went down to Puerto Rico for some workups, I think right after I turned 18, and then not long after that, we deployed um, north of the 39th parallel in the North Adriatic Sea, where um, we joined the battle group that was bombing. So that was the first time I watched the country get bombed, and um, I was barely 18. Yeah. Most of the pictures from the shore leave that we had on that deployment, it's mostly just me in drinking establishments with my shipmates. Um, I did get to see a lot of stuff. I mean, the Navy delivers when, when you're on sea duty, they, they send you all over. So I got to hit some really cool ports. Um, deck work sucks. You know, it's manual labor. But um, it's kind of fun, you know. I mean, the people that you work with, um, some people go to college, some people serve in duck department. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it was rowdy, um, you know, a lot of us drank. But it was, seemed like more of an innocent time, I guess, perhaps because I was, a lot of us were so young. And um, this was our first, a lot of people, it was their first time on an airplane. It was my first time on an airplane going to boot camp flying from Kansas City to Chicago, yeah. Um, so just, just to live on a ship, um, it was kind of a culture shock. And then to ship out and go to foreign ports, you know, and you're not even old enough to drink back in the United States, but you pull into a, a European port and you're 18, you're allowed, you're allowed to drink, so... You know, it was it was really cool. A lot of this stuff I wasn't supposed to do because I wasn't of legal age yet, technically. So I think it's funny. Like, they'll let you join at 17, but and you can go shoot people in the face for a living, but you can't have a beer. <laughs> the Navy's advancement, it's your test scores plus your evaluation scores plus any points you get from any kind of a qualifying awards award points um, and your physical readiness test scores, all of that combined um, determines whether or not you're going to advance. And, but one key factor is 
are there enough open billets? Are there enough jobs available for you to advance? Because if your rate is what they call closed, rate in the Navy is a job, like in the Army, it'd be an MOS. So in the Navy, if your rate is closed, meaning there are just too many people and you know there's, there's no opportunity for upward mobility, you're just stuck at the rank you're at until something opens up and you need to keep your numbers up in order to advance. So um, I decided I wanted to be a quartermaster which is a navigator in the Navy. In the Army, it's supply, a navigator, um, enlisted navigator in the Navy. Um, and I'd spent an awful lot of time up there um, on my off hours um, learning at, at the chart table and up there on the signal bridge, I learned how to shoot stars, learning all about navigation. And um, so I was encouraged to take the QM3 exam, which I did, but I did not advance because um, there are just too many people. And um, I ended up getting capped, they call capped, where um, departments or, you know, commands, they'll get a certain number of caps um, per advancement cycle. And so, like, say if you have someone that didn't make it just because the rate was closed or whatever, and you still want that sailor to advance, you can use that cap on the sailor. So um, navigation department use, capped me to third um, to get me out of deck and pull me up into navigation department. So that's how I ended up getting out of deck. I spent like a year and a half in deck and then um, I moved up to navigation and there were some people in deck that were protesting that, um, trying to say I didn't have the right ASVAB scores or something or whatever and you know the people who trained me up in navigation department were like that's nonsense. We want her. So they fought for me and they got me. Oftentimes like lookouts, um, you know deck seamen, um, in the watch rotation, they will drive the ships unless we're in restricted maneuvering or the seas are really heavy or something. And then they'll call one of us, uh, master helmsman, to go drive when things are difficult. So I think during my second deployment, this is the 9-11 deployment. So on 9-11, um, I was on board the USS Arctic and we were just finishing up our deployment. We had just finished up our two months in the Persian Gulf and we were in the Red Sea awaiting transit through the Suez Canal. I think we were supposed to go like the next morning. Deployment. Sometime during that deployment, prior to 9-11, I, I don't recall if it was prior or after, but it was on that deployment that I had a dream. And in my dream, there was some like evil entity lurking. And mind you at this time, I'm agnostic at best. I don't necessarily believe in God, like maybe there's something, but I know I'm not interested in religion or any of that stuff, and I don't believe in paranormal, supernatural, woo-woo stuff, like, so I had this dream that there was something evil lurking on the ship, and it was in the fuel holds, it was in the, the area of the ship that stores the fuel that we pump to other ships, and nobody believed me. In my dream, I kept trying to tell people, like, there's something evil down there. It's, it's lurking all over the place now, and nobody believed me. And I don't think I told anybody about it until years later, but um, um, I had a conversation with E. Douglas Brown. I've got a couple of his books here on my shelf. Um, he's out in Scottsdale. He, um, he's a psychologist. Um, he's also, he was one of Dr. Khalifa's pupils. Um, he asked me about dreams and I told him about that dream and um, he told me that that was likely a djinn, an ancient djinn demon that was trying to latch on or something. I, you know, I don't know. It's plausible, I suppose, but I, I, I wouldn't bet any money on being able to like analyze my dreams and extract any kind of useful information from it. Yeah. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, not looking for something in the future. Maybe in hindsight, yeah. you know, because I, I don't know this for certain, but I've read that when we dream, um, our brains are processing information. Yeah. And then there's this whole deal about, like, what is happening with us in the spirit world. And what is it, that silver, it's like an umbilical cord, that silver cord. So it ties our soul to our body while we're sleeping or unconscious yeah and um so yeah i <laughs> no, no, yeah yeah that's fascinating stuff you know some people are more just like, more intuitive or sometimes yeah just... oh i've had some creepy feelings too there yeah. there was one time actually 
two, actually there are a few, and this is just in the past couple of years. Um, I was in an appointment at the Tucson VA, and I had walked out of the appointment having fired my psychiatrist. Like, she works for the VA, but she don't work for me anymore. And um, I had walked out, and I had gone the long way around instead of the shortest distance to my car, and I don't know why, but I just had this, God redirected me that day. And so I had ended up going the long way around the building and out to the parking lot where I had parked. And I had walked right by, a, 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 there was like three police officers standing to my right outside of the door that I normally would have exited. And I was just going, and I just got this feeling like the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I was just like, and I just said, you know, hi or good day or something, and I just kept walking. Well, I later learned that those police were there waiting for me. The psychiatrist had called them. They were going to try to commit me. After I'd given my psychiatrist a copy of that Quran and told her that I'm not interested in big pharma anti-solutions anymore, I only wanted to talk to someone because I thought, well, since I'm going to be opening my mouth about some things, it might be a good idea to let someone know, you know, in case something happens to me. Not by my own hand, but in case something happens, you know, yeah. I need to let somebody know. So, um, I don't, they act like they have some kind of authority over you, these people down at the VA, which they don't. But that was creepy. That was creepy because they do that to veterans all the time. Like, I just, I was like, I, I, I no longer need your services anymore. And, like, the cognitive dissonance washed over her. And, but I had learned that that was a setup. Like, they had planned that in advance. What was 9-11 like for you? 9-11? <clears throat> well, we were in the Red Sea awaiting transit through the Suez Canal. And, ah, sorry, I'm old and crickety. Um, I remember I was, I think I was going up on watch or something. It was, in, it was during the daytime where we were in the Red Sea. And um, we had a little TV on um, up in the chart house, um, the, the chart room, the quartermaster space. And um, on the ship, we had the satellite TV. Um, it's like Armed Forces something. I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's AFARTS. We'd call it AFARTS. And um, so I remember walking in the chart house, and you walk in, and immediately, like, the chart table's here, and the little TV's right up here. I remember watching, and like, the tree towers had already been hit. But then there were images of the Pentagon. I started talking about the Pentagon. And we're just looking at each other, like, we're waiting for message traffic to come up from operations, which was just one deck below us. Um, and sure enough, like, I want to say less than an hour after receiving word about the Pentagon, we got message traffic instructing us, ordering us to turn around and head right to the North Arabian Sea, high speed. And so that's what we did. We hauled ass up to the North Arabian Sea and began to await further instructions. And we're also awaiting a second battle group. And then from that point forward, for roughly two months, we floated around these imaginary boxes that we would plot. We'd get coordinates from whoever above us, whoever, um, what was it, CTF-50, um, watching the gunships bomb Afghanistan. And it was a bombing campaign. And um, we were cut off from communications, OPSEC, InfoSec, which is a joke because we weren't able to call home, obviously not able to receive calls, no email, no snail mail, like regular mail. Um, and yet you've got Geraldo Rivera drawing battle group diagrams in the sand and we can't call home to let our families know we're okay. Uh, between the USS Arctic and SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 1, I spent a year in Diego Garcia and so I worked operations control with operations specialists there um, I was a senior female at the command um, just boring operations control stuff sit reps radios lots of radios <laughs> um, a lot of time working in a building with no windows and 
satellites and equip antennas and computers. Um, also did diplomatic clearance coordination for um, overflight into foreign airspace for our guys. Um, we did a lot of NATO um, operations. Um, so that was kind of my, I guess, segue into the intelligence community. I had my tour there. On a spiritual level, in hindsight, I guess I, um, I performed the satanic ritual of having an abortion. <laughs> I, I, I ended up pregnant um, not long before I was due for my desert rotation up in Masira, Oman. And um, my command was very um, accommodating. I was given temporary orders to Simbalong Naval Air Base in Singapore. I arranged for my own abortion and the Navy got me on an Air Force flight over to Singapore, put me up in the sling in. I had my abortion, came back, went up to do my desert rotation. Um, so like on a spiritual level, I mean a lot of women in the military have had abortions. Most of my female shipmates, most, have all had at least one abortion. Most. Not all, but most. Um, so it seemed like kind of a rite of passage for women in the military. And of course I was an atheist, maybe an agnostic then, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't too, um... let me take that back. I, I felt bad about it, but you know, from all the liberal talking points regarding abortion, that was kind of my mindset then. So, um, but I had a dream uh, the night before, I think it was the night before I flew to Singapore to have the abortion. The soul of the unborn child that I was about to pay to have someone murder um, asked, like, mommy, why'd you kill me or something like that. Like one of those dreams creeps me out. Yeah, so from there... <laughs> and all that took place there, my detailer offered me orders to Hawaii. And I'm like, Hawaii, okay. I didn't know what. SDVT1. That was all I was told. I didn't know what that was. I got online. I tried to find information about it. Secure data voice transmitter. I found information on that, but that's not what SDVT was. That was SEAL delivery vehicle team. So you've got SEAL teams 1 through 10. SEAL Team 6, a.k.a. Naval Special Warfare Developmental Group, a.k.a. DevGuru, didn't officially exist until they had to pull that out for some more pig propaganda. Um, and then there were the two SDV teams. And I was at SDV Team 1. And we had the only advanced um, SDV, the ASDS. Um, so taking orders there, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. I, I really, I didn't know. I really didn't know. And I didn't have much of a turnover with my predecessor either. Um, there were a few emails, and I think the guy was gone before I even arrived. Uh, my background was in navigation, so obviously I, I ran what they called a chart house. Um, you know, anything to do with maps, charts, geodesy, tides, currents, things like that. Um, when you work in a SEAL team, you wear more than one hat. Everyone wears more than one hat, so my collateral duty was personnel security, security clearances, and then I was also sent to learn the physical security system, um, you know, making IDs, badges, you know, uh, electromagnetic key card swipe and pins. I don't know how I ended up there, really I don't. I, I, in hindsight, on a spiritual level, like you've got the physical world and the spiritual world, so I wasn't aware of the spiritual realm then, so on a spiritual level, I guess <laughs> I was ticking the boxes to go work for the devil and the lion's den, I don't know. Um, but on a physical level, like as far as we're aware of as humans, I still don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, Diego Garcia is considered isolated duty. Um, I did well enough there. But I don't know, like, I don't know if they were specifically looking for a woman to fill that billet or what. I really don't know because when it comes to what I refer to as spook city, like, 
here's one thing I do know. What naval special warfare wants, naval special warfare gets. Well, I was approached one day <clears throat> by my department head. And he said, hey, Amanda, would you like to go learn Arabic? And everybody's on a first name basis in his old team. Officers and enlisted both. So he's like, hey, Amanda, would you like to go learn some Arabic? And I'm like, okay. Uh, what? And he's like, well, this is going to be part of your work day. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And so I wasn't told why. Um, they brought in a professor from the University of Hawaii, an Arabic professor. Um, he's originally from Yemen. Very nice man. Uh, practicing Muslim. And um, he would come to the SEAL compound a few times a week to give us private Arabic tutoring. And um, I did well in Arabic. I liked it. I've always loved foreign languages. My ASVAB, I... I may have scored higher on language on the ASVAB than, than anything else I'd have to go back and look, but I've always been interested in language, so I did well because I liked it, and I studied hard. Um, Arabic's, um, it's a cool language to learn. Very, very precise language. Um, very good for law. I, I wasn't told why. <laughs> so what caused you to leave the military, and um, how did you officially leave? During... Um, Chief Dan Healy's memorial service in Coronado or San Diego, where I forget, everything's kind of a blur from that time. This is 2005. Um, this is after Operation Red Wings, obviously. And, um, you know, we're running from funeral to memorial service and whatever. And um, I was sitting in the back of McPee's which is the infamous seal bar in Coronado in that G.I. Jane movie. And um, one of the warrant officers that would bounce between... See, SDV Team 1 was a, a kind of like a funnel for DevGrew. So there would be like some warrant officers, some old heads um, that would kind of float between DevGrew and SDV Team 1 to well, groom and Dev recruit. Group, before we go uh, for, further in that story, what is DevGrew for those who don't know? SEAL Team 6, Naval Special Warfare Developmental Group. And what are they famous for? They are famous for, well, it depends on who you ask, <laughs> but they're famous for allegedly assassinating Osama bin Laden. But Extortion 17 is no longer around to speak about it. So, so Extortion 17, a lot of those guys were allegedly on the team that assassinated Osama bin Laden. Minus Rob O'Neill, who's still living, obviously. He goes by Makuya on Instagram. Um, everybody else is involuntarily expired. And um, there's a book that, um, God willing, I will buy and read. Um, Aaron Vaughn is one of the DevGrew seals that were killed um, that day. His father wrote a book. Um, there are some families who are upset by what happened and um, the official narrative and, well, you know how the governments are with their official narratives, but there were a few, like, older SEALs who would float between DevGrew and SCB Team 1 to groom and recruit. And um, so, one, um, we were at Dan Healy's memorial at McPee's and... Um, this guy was sitting back in the back, like out on the back patio all by himself. And I just went out there to go sit with him. You know, like, hey, what's up? Because everybody's in there, you know. And of course, it's been a hard day. Funerals and whatnot. And um, I just asked him, like, you know, what's going on? And we're talking. And he's like, Amanda, why don't you come to DevGrew? And I'm like, why? And by this time... Some stuff had already happened, like some sexual assault incidents, some other stuff, and it really made me question, like, what the hell am I even doing here? And I asked him, I was like, so, all right, you want me to go to DevGrew, but what would I do there? And he's like, same thing you're doing here, because my predecessor went to DevGrew. My predecessor, the QM1, my predecessor was a male. 
um, in the position that I held there. So he went to DevGrew. A lot of people from SDV team would go to DevGrew. And I'm like, do the same thing that I'm doing here. And everything is just like flashing in my mind. Like, what is it that I do here? Like, things get confusing when you're constantly being like gaslit and lied to and used as a useful idiot. You work in the intelligence community long enough, you're a useful idiot for someone at some point. Guaranteed. No one, no one is immune to the whole useful idiot situation. Everyone's a useful idiot for someone at some point. But anyway, um, yeah, he invited me to DevGrew, and I never followed up on it because all the stuff that happened later, I was just, um, you know, with the new department head and... Um, you know, I was being asked to do some things that I knew were not legal um, with the badge machine. I'll have to dig up the name of that journalist, but there was a journalist, a credible journalist who wrote about this a few years ago, Dick Cheney, kicking around the idea of dressing Navy SEALs up as Iranians to fire upon U.S. naval ships for false flag purposes. Yeah, well, from 03 to 06, I was in the office of that SEAL team with the with a machine that can make any kind of ID we wanted. I was badge girl. And so that and some other stuff that I, you know, there's just so much stuff, so much dishonesty, deception, um, ego. Like I remember at, right as soon as um, we got word about Alpha Platoon, Alpha Platoon, that was our guy, five of our guys, um, Six, if you count Marcus Luttrell, um, who was the lone survivor, the only one who survived that incident, June 28, 2005. Um, five of the deceased were our guys, Alpha Platoon. Marcus was also Alpha Platoon, and then the rest of them were from other, other teams. But um, So when we first got word about Alpha Platoon, and we weren't sure if Marcus Luttrell was alive or not, we thought it was, we thought that it, there was a, there was a beacon. Um, it was Mike Murphy's beacon. Uh, we later learned that Marcus had had it. And then we got word that like allegedly Matt Axelson was captured and they were going to chop his head off on video. And like we were getting all these different reports and in the middle of all of that, there were a few comments, and these were officers. Some of them were SEALs, already talking about books and movies. Already. Already. Like, they're already famous. And I watched that grow. And then there was all this other stuff going on, and of course my personal life was a mess. Usually was. And um, there, there came a time where I just, I, I, I hated showing up. I, I really hated showing up, but the Navy is not like a regular job where you can just put in your two weeks notice and you're gone, or you can just leave. The Navy's not like that. You're under contract. So you got to suck it up. And so there's our, there had already been a few sexual assault incidents that I just, I just like, it is what it is. And um, then there were other requests that were made, and I would either deflect with, well, let me run that by my intello, my intel officer, or something, whatever, you know, I wasn't trying to say no, but I was just like, you know, these are what the directives say, and this is what you're asking me to do, and the, and the, and the atmosphere in special operations, especially in that SEAL team was whatever gets the job done, so whatever gets the job done, even if you're breaking the rules, whatever gets the job done, because when you have bureaucrats setting rules for you, and they don't understand what it's like to operate. You can see why an operator would be like, screw that rule, because they don't know what it's like to be here at the tip of the spear doing what we're doing. So there's that. And I don't necessarily disagree with that, but there are certain rules in place for a reason. You know, like we are no better than the enemy if we behave like the enemy, right? So we've got to have some kind of integrity. And in Spook City, there's very little. Very little integrity in Spook City. And I'm referring to the intelligence community. So everything I thought I knew was a lie. My first husband um, and I 
our marriage didn't last very long. Um, and this has to do with the orders that I was cut. So long story short, we didn't know each other all that well, it turns out, and we ended up getting married. And um, he was stationed on a ship in out of J Yokosuka, Japan, and I was the SEAL team. We put in for spouse co-location. The Navy would not honor it. They said we were too mission critical in our respective positions, so they weren't going to move either one of us. And he was unfaithful. I didn't want to be married anymore because of that. And so... Um, he was upset that I did not want to have an open marriage and I wanted a divorce. And it turns out he knew my detailer. The detailer in the military is the person that cuts your orders. They make sure that their billets are filled and, you know, qualified people go to the positions that they're qualified for, whatever. They coordinate all of that wherever you get your orders and, and all that. So it turns out that my ex-husband had served with my detailer. And I thought, oh, okay, well, no big deal until I was up for orders. Now, mind you, I had already been invited to DevGrew by that warrant officer at Healy's Memorial. And I had finished, I had completed the advanced cell nav and senior navigator refresher over at Pearl Harbor. And the two instructors for that course were begging me to come teach because I did so well by God's leave. And I was like, cool, I'll think about it. And so when I was up for orders, I put in for that. And I still have, when I was going through all my old papers and stuff, I still have a little post-it note that one of the instructors had written and said, this is exactly what you need to do. You need to call so-and-so, tell them so-and-so wants you, and then we get these orders arranged for you. And that's usually how it goes. It's kind of a good old boy system, you know, but instead of getting a stranger and they don't know their aptitudes, like, they already had me in their course. They, you know, they know I'm good. They want me. So um, I did that. I submitted for those orders. Um, in the meantime, I was having issues with my department head, who I'm pretty sure hates women, or at least maybe he did at the time. He was upset because I had the largest computer monitor in Intel, but I was also the map person, and I didn't ask for that monitor. That was put in before, my pro before I even showed up. So why did I have the big monitor? Because I work with maps. Um, but he thought, it, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman, and the atmosphere, a lot of these guys, they don't want women in special ops. And they don't want women in special ops with any kind of authority or any kind of um, like major responsibility, right? This is, there are people with that mentality. Not everybody, but it's there. Um, he hated me. I didn't do anything to him. I, you know, like, I, and I was informed by the intel specialist that um, was in the Arabic class with me. He's like, Amanda, he does not like you. He hates you. And I'm like, really? Because what what I ever do to that guy, you know? And so, like, he hated me. And um, he was um, obviously, um, uh, I don't know, he might have been a flight school dropout. I don't know. Um, I know he's a brown shoe guy. I know he came from the aviation community. And um, all he would talk about is Devru, Devru, Devru. I'm going to go to, like, he really wanted to be a cool guy, right? So for these guys that are not SEALs, they're not operators, they come in their station at commands like this, like, as a man, I'm sure you can only imagine, like, you've got these studs over here who are over there doing all the cool guy stuff, and then here you are, you know. And so there's, like, a, a, an ego problem, yeah. right? And so the command master chief, who was a SEAL, um, same mentality with women. Then one day, my department head comes over and hands me my orders. And... He was, like, real smug about it. He had a big old grin on his face. And mind you, this is after I had been approached to do some stuff that was illegal. And after I was given direct orders to do stuff that was illegal, and I said, no, you do it. This is the conversation I had with my department head one day. I said, you do it. Um, so I received orders to galley duty in Lemoore, California. I was a QM1, basically aced my cell nav in advance, or a senior nav refresher over at Pearl Harbor. The instructors really wanted me to go teach. 
for my next set of orders, I would have loved to have done that, or go back to a ship. Um, I didn't even bother following up on the dev group thing, because if it's as bad at SDV Team 1, what's it going to be like at dev group with all the stories of the canoeing? You know what canoeing is? So when you shoot someone at close range, and it splits top their head open like a canoe. Yeah, well, some guys have turned that into a sport. And some guys over at Dev Group kept a binder of pictures. And then there was, oh, one woman was getting banged in San Diego, but I don't know, some guys from SEAL Team 7. It was so long ago, but snapped her neck. And all the horrible stuff I'd seen. And I don't, don't get me wrong, like, not everybody's like that, but that culture is very much there. Um, and, and you'll have that when you have certain personalities in a proxy war. And the op tempo is high, constantly deploying, constantly killing people. You know, like, war is hell. And it really, even when it comes to, like, the best men, you know, the most psychologically sound, grounded men, like, that, that affects even them. Probably not to that degree, but it affects everybody. So, um, there's already that culture there. Um, and so, yeah, he handed me those orders. And I thought to myself, is this my ex-husband? Because my ex-husband was pretty upset with me that I wanted a divorce. And um, so did my ex-husband have any influence over this? Because how is that the best use of Navy resources? You know what I mean? Like, so what I would be doing there at galley duty is I'd be essentially working in a cafeteria checking lunch tickets or something. Something stupid like that. So here I am with all these nav skills. I don't even really want to work in the intel community anymore. Send me back to the damn fleet. Let me go across Pearl Harbor and go teach, you know. Um, but no, like they had, they made their point. And the command master chief upon checkout threatened me. He mentioned something about being a woman. And like he made it very clear that women are not welcome. So I put in my paperwork, I got out. I said, all right, well, I guess I'm leaving the military because if, if this is how they do you, then why stay? I'm not saying I was a perfect sailor or anything. I mean, obviously not. But when it came to my job, I showed up for my job. I did my job and I did it well. You, people could say whatever they wanted to say about my personal life. But even, even back before I believed in God, I still had a moral compass. I, I thought I had maybe been blackballed from government employment for a while because I applied for a lot of positions, GIS positions, geospatial information systems, which I had a background in. I had um, Falcon View and ArcGIS and uh, CAP and Program and other digital mapping systems. Um, I had even applied for some administrative stuff, though I was not a, a, an administrator. Um, I had done some uh, Unix administrator and other um, IT related coursework before I left. And these were on uh, a DOD system. And um, I just kept applying for jobs, applying for jobs, applying for jobs, and I just wasn't getting anything. I'm like, okay. And so I um, shelved books at the Plaza Library in Kansas City for a while just to kind of decompress and decide, you know, what I want to do. and something was wrong and I never, I, I just couldn't articulate what it was that I was feeling. Um, and the information that I had departed with. And trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, I had began constructing an email, composing, I had began composing an email to like some alternative media outlets. Um, and I never finished the email. And I eventually deleted the email. I never sent it, never even finished it, never even got to the juicy bits. I just decided against it because there was just some spooky stuff taking place. Um, and um, of course I, I went home and I played dead. I went home and I played dead less that email that I began composing that I never finished and I eventually deleted, but some spooks had come out of the woodwork. Um, sometimes you don't know what you know until later. It wasn't long after that, it was about maybe six, seven months after my departure that I 
was kind of interested in the whole God thing. So once, once God rung my bell, I just didn't see a need to talk about anything. Like, if God's got me, then I don't care. <laughs> you know? When I got out of the Navy, Max, Kevin, and I had stopped to, to visit my cousin Scott, and um, they had a little barbecue for us, and we were just chit-chatting, and we didn't know each other very well. And so um, his wife was informing me of the Wiccan ways, you know, and um, just trying to bring me into the fold. She had given me a book. I don't recall the title of the book. I no longer have the book. But um, it was essentially one woman's journey into witchcraft. And um, once I got home, I was kind of interested, and I was reading it, and I was trying some things here and there, and some spell work and stuff, and I just, well, this is nonsense. <laughs> you know? Didn't believe. So um, I cast that aside. Um, I started journaling because of the crazy dreams I was having at the time. Um, but like it's my foray into Wicca or, you know, spell work and stuff, it was brief and, um, disappointing. <laughs> Nothing worked yeah. for me. Anyway. So what led you to the Quran? Well, um, I had taken a job waiting tables at a local Mediterranean restaurant, but the owners were from Jordan. So obviously Arabic is their first language. The father was uh, an English teacher in Jordan. So I thought, great, I'll just come wait some tables. You know, I had some experience from having waited some tables here and there when I was a teenager before I joined the Navy. Um, so I'm just like, cool, I'll just, I'll just do this too and wait tables and keep up on my Arabic. Because that's really, one, I love, you know, Mughal food. I love, you know, Mediterranean food. You know, I like that kind of food, but also the Arabic. You know, I could s stay current and maybe even learn some more from native speakers just in everyday conversation or whatever. And um, one of the employees was, um, I guess the, these were Sunnis. And the guy, I think he was originally from Masr. He was um, Egyptian. And um, I remember the other guys telling me, he's very religious. So, like, when it comes to women interacting with, I mean, you find this with Orthodox Jews, too. Like, you know, you don't be, they don't shake hands with women, you know, they don't spend too much time looking you in the eye, you know. So, I was just told that he's very religious. But if you're interested, talk to him. He's willing to talk to you. So, I was just kind of interested because I hadn't really had all that much exposure to Islam. Funny enough, like, we're fighting this global war on terror. And... In hindsight, it's interesting to me how very little people involved in those operations knew about Islam. How very little they knew. So my introduction really was through my Arabic teacher. And um, that was kind of minimal. But then um, I started talking to this guy that was working at that um, Mediterranean restaurant. And he would given me a couple pamphlets or something and I read through them. And... Um, he invited me to their Juma, the Friday Congregational Prayer, to go take my Shahada, which is not required, it's not a Quranic requirement to take your Shahada. Like, you either bear witness there's no God besides the one God or not. You What's know? a Shahada? Shahada is a proclamation of faith. Okay. So, traditionally, as per Hadith and Sunnah and whatever else Saudi decides, they, um, if you're going to convert, you've got to take an Arabic name and you have to stand in front of the Imam the preacher, and you have to state the proclamation of faith, which the false shahada, and this is something interesting because I wasn't aware of this at the time, but here's what they have you do. They have you, you know, you go to the masjid or whatever, and um, it's like people getting baptized and, you know, uh, accepting Jesus into their heart. Well, for um, for Muslims, what they do is they go and they... they say their shahada, ashhadu wa la ilaha illa Allah, but they say, wa Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness there's no God besides the one God, and Muhammad is a slave and messenger. That is their proclamation of faith. There are so many things wrong with that. Mentioning Muhammad, number one, um, if you're going to mention Muhammad, you've got to mention all of them. And you can't mention all of them, because not all of them have been named. So I remember standing there, 
and I'm to recite the Shahada, their corrupt, idolatrous Shahada. And I remember staring at the guy, I'm like staring at him like right through the forehead. And he's having me repeat after him. And so I say, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. But then when he goes to say, Wa Muhammad Rasulullah, my body froze. Couldn't say it. I didn't know it at the time. Now I know why. But I, my body froze no matter what I did. I, I couldn't make my mouth move. And then he said the last part in English. And Muhammad is a slave and messenger. And then I repeated that. And it was like maybe a month later that I learned about the 19 code and the correct shahada. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. I bear witness there is no God besides the one God. He alone is God. He has no partners. Strict monotheism. So. Do you have any backlash from family or friends yep. for making this conversion? Absolutely. Um, my ex-husband, Kevin, was born and brought up in Malaysia. He's ethnic Chinese. They call him Nonyas. Um, his family, I guess, fled when the communists took over China. And so here they are, an ethnic and religious minority in Malaysia, which is a so-called Muslim country. And his mother's family was Christian. His father's family was like Buddhist. Taoist. And so like in his family, they're always fighting about religion. But then he had the one uncle who married a local girl, uh, indigenous Malay. And if you're indigenous Malay, you're Muslim, whether you like it or not. And um, he had to convert and take an Arabic name and go through all that whole process that's not in the Quran. And it caused a big rift in his family. And, uh, you know, the majority of Muslims there in Malaysia often don't treat the minorities well. So he told me, because we were secular when we met, you know, that was one of the things that attracted us to each other was that we weren't religious people. And um, he told me that out of all the religions, I had to pick the worst one. Now, not only that, but Dr. Khalifa's translation is banned in Malaysia. I know people, a, a few people in Malaysia who have to practice in secret, like they, much like they do over in Iran. They don't talk about the 19 code with people, they don't, because uh, Saudi Arabia has declared it haram, they want to suppress that information because their idolatry is exposed. Um, it's a problem. I, I would not be able to enter the country with that Quran translation. So he, he's like, I can't take you home now. You know, I, I can't take you back to Malaysia now. And then there's a deal with his parents, and his parents were concerned, and, you know, because they think Islam is just crazy because of what they see over there. You know, so um, there was that. There was my, um, my immediate family, um, my stepfather especially. He was not happy. When my sister got married, we were... Um, go back to my parents' house, and I had gifted my brother Jamie a Quran. And um, Kevin and I pulled in the driveway of my parents' house, and I see my brother standing there in the driveway in front of the house, just kind of waving us off, saying, just go home. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, my sister just got married, we're going back to my parents' house for a little reception thing, and Oh no, my stepdad's in the backyard in front of a freaking barrel that you burn trash in. He's ripping pages out of the Quran and burning it <laughs> in protest. And he had something to say about evil and what would your dead friends think of you now? Referring to um, SDBT1 guys who were killed during Operation Red Wings. Yeah. He, what would your dead friend, stuff like that. And so I was estranged from my family, obviously, for a little while. Um, my mom really wasn't all that concerned. She was more concerned about, like, all the radical jihadi stuff that she saw in the media. And once I had an opportunity to sit down and explain to my mother what's what, like, she understood. And, and she was cool with it. 
Um, my stepdad, he's been on or off. He's, he's cool now with it. But I went through, everybody goes through that test. I went through that test. It's me or God. It's me or the Quran. And I went through those tests with my immediate family, with my spouse at the time. Um, had some friends that didn't want to talk to me anymore. Amanda, how could you? You know, um, I had other friends who stuck with me regardless because they're like, you're the same person. You just a little better. What about the Quran made you believe? Mm, well, oh, goodness. So, my first, maybe on the other shelf, no, it's up there. My first ever uh, Quran translation was um, Yusuf Ali. It was uh, English, Arabic, and transliteration. And um, I had started reading that, and I don't know why, but immediately I went to the back and I started memorizing in Arabic. Surah 113 and 114, which is, um, Surah 113 is daybreak, Surah 114 is people. And these are prayers, and I say them often now. Um, they're like magic spells, if you will. Um, uh, Surah 113, daybreak, al-falaq, bismillahirrahmanirrahim, awzubirabir falaq, wa min shari khalaq, what that means is daybreak in the name of God most gracious, most merciful. I seek refuge in the Lord of daybreak from the evils among his creations, from the evils of darkness as it falls, from the evils of the troublemakers, and from the evils that they envy us when they envy. <laughs> and then um, people, 114, Anas, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Awzubir Abinnas, Malikinas, Elahinas, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I seek refuge in the Lord of the people, the King of the people, the God of the people, from the evils of the sneaky whispers who whisper into the chest of the people, be they of the jinns or the people. Because them jinns be whispering too. But don't you dare go talk to a psychiatrist about it. <laughs> right? So... I learned those, those are the first two that I learned, and I don't know why now, I guess I know why. And then uh, uh, December 2019, I memorized 112, which is absoluteness. Um, yeah, Ali Klaas, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Hu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yaleh, Walam Yalad, Walam Yakuluhu Kufa Wanahad. That is absoluteness in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. He is the one and only God, the absolute God. Never did he beget, nor was he begotten. None equals him. Okay. Evangelicals don't like that. <laughs> All right. And was there anything else about the, the Quran or the culture that, that made you want to stick to it? Wanna... So the culture, I was kind of intrigued by the whole hijab burqa situation. Um, because... Um, as a reformed whore of Babylon, I just didn't want to be seen anymore. Um, I still would like to buy a burqa and some roller skates and just cruise through town like that, like one of those Pac-Man ghosts. Not because it has anything to do with Islam, but because I can. <laughs> Why not? Um, but no, seriously, I was kind of intrigued by that. Um, but that's not a Quranic requirement. That's a cultural thing. I abandoned that pretty quickly. Um, focus on the family, but that's more of a cultural thing too. Asians are a familial society, so there's a big focus on, I mean, you're Mexican, so you, it's similar, very similar. Uh, I was just so put off by a lot of the hypocrite Christians, particularly those at the SEAL team, the master chief, the department head, they were Christian, so-called Christian. I doubt they fit the biblical definition of a Christian. If Jesus were here, he probably wouldn't save him, even if he could. Um, but I digress. I, I was just totally put off by, you know, that culture. Christian contemporary music is pretty cringe, in my opinion. It's not my favorite genre. I don't care much for country music either. Um, but I was just, it was more the mysticism, like the Sufi mysticism that, that really kind of piqued my interest. And Dr. Khalifa's father was a Sufi leader in Egypt. So um, the Islam that Dr. Khalifa preached had more of a Sufi vibe to it because there's, there's a focus in the Quran on meditation. 
meditation at night is more effective. And I suspect that has something to do with the Schumann resonance and how that changes at night. Um, and if you notice um, at dawn, not sunrise, but dawn, like that, that transition from night until dawn, which here this time of year is like about 5 a.m., that transition from night to dawn, if you sit outside and you observe, you hear everything start to wake up around dawn. And as the sun moves higher over the celestial sphere, but not quite over our sphere, because it's not sunrise yet, you know, more things awaken, you can hear more. Um, so that whole meditation thing, which I totally suck at, um, you know, I was intrigued, like, why? Why? Why, the, why this a lot? Why? Like, I wanted to know why. I want to know why. I, I, I would always hate it when my mother or my father would tell me to do something, and I'd ask why, and they say, because I said so. Hate that. I think most people do. I think that's what turns a lot of people into atheists when it comes to religion and, and adhering to religious doctrine and these rules. Why? Give me a good reason why. So I wanted to know why. Why all of these practices? And I, I was told that I was no longer lawful to my husband because he would not convert to Islam. And this is um, uh, a, I forget the name of the masjid or the mosque in Kansas City, black community. Um, I think probably Nation of Islam affiliate, um, Sunni, um, they told me I was no longer lawful to him. And so I was like, well, I need to know where it says that in the Quran. Tell me where it states that I'm no longer lawful to my husband. And I still have the book. I was given a book, A Hand Through the Door for My New Sister. And in that book, it explains Islam for women, new converts, women. And it, um, there's a contradiction in that book. I wish I would have bookmarked it. But there's a contradiction in that book. And it mostly refers to hadiths. And on one page it says I'm lawful to my husband. On another page it says I'm not. And so I asked the gal who was kind of my mentor. I was like, so what's up with this? Like, I want to know in the Quran. Show me in the Quran where it says this. And no one could give me a satisfactory answer. They all kept referring to Hadith, which contradicted the Quran and contradict each other. And so I started looking around online. And I was discouraged from looking around online. I was discouraged from seeking answers. And um, I stumbled upon a website that, because I, I remember using the words Quran alone or only Quran. Like, I wanted to know this in the Quran. And um, I came upon a website that was like, anti-Quran alone, anti-19 code, like how do you know how to do this or how to do that without Hadith and Sunnah? And I was like, well, what is this Quran alone thing and what is this 19 thing? And so I went down that rabbit hole and I found submission.org, which was um, uh, Dr. Khalifa's brother's wife, Basma. Um, that's her organization. And then um, Masjid Tucson which is obviously here in Tucson, I found their website, ordered Dr. Khalifa's translation and a few other books, and I read, learned about the 19 Code, and um, I was just like, well, this is it. Because having, like, this kind of atheist mindset, like, I give me, give me some proof. Sorry, I messed this up. Give me some proof. All I ever asked religious people for was proof that, number one, God exists. Let me fix this. Um, prove to me that God exists. And, furthermore, prove to me that your doctrine, your scripture, your way of life, your religion, prove to me that it's from that God. Prove to me. And no one could ever provide me with proof. And that's precisely the function this 19 code has served to convince those of us who don't believe that this is a divine scripture. Like, these are sacred instructions. This is mathematically coded, incontrovertible evidence, Carl Sagan contact variety, right? So when yeah. you strip the dogma and you strip the cultural baggage and what you're left with, the essence, you know, it really helps you understand, like, who you are, why you're here, and what to do about it. So Dr. Khalifa is the one who discovered the 19 code, correct? Yeah, 1974. 
So let's start with him. So, so who is Dr. Khalifa and what did he do? What's the work that he did prior to the 19 code? Well, Dr. Khalifa was an Egyptian American biochemist. He did some work for the UN. Um, he um, was married to a white American, had two children. And um, oh, interestingly enough, Muammar Gaddafi had him imprisoned at one point, and I don't know why. A lot of those old heads over there at the Majid, they don't even know why, but they know Gaddafi had him in prison for a minute. Um, he began translating the Quran for his children because there are initials at the beginning of a lot of chapters, not all of them, but. Um, uh, Islamic scholars have debated for over 1400 years what do these initials mean? No one knows. And so I believe he was working at Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri. Anheuser-Busch or Bud what? Anyway, the beer factory in St. Louis. And um, he plugged all of the raw data into a computer just to see what, what shakes out, see if a pattern emerges. And a pattern did emerge. And at the time, the two false verses were still there at the end of Surah 9, which Salman Rushdie, who was recently attacked in New York, um, uh, Iran and other so-called Muslim organizations declared a fatwa, meaning kill the guy, he's an apostate, um, for his novel, The Satanic Verses. And that's what those two verses are. They've always been disputed. Um, in terms of the context, it does not fit with the hardcore monotheistic tone in the Quran. The two verses commemorate Muhammad, they don't belong. They were, they were injected. And the code exposed that. Um, because this code would emerge in other places, but then when it came to the end of chapter 9, like, it, it just didn't jive. So, remove those two verses, they stuck out like a sore thumb anyway, and boom. And the same code was found in intact portions of the Hebrew Torah, the Old Testament. And so if this code did not exist independent of the Quran, I don't know that I would be so convinced. But because it does, it, it, you know, it is what it is. So I do my best to adhere to these sacred instructions. But um, when Dr. Khalifa cracked that code by God's leave, he started informing, obviously, the Arab world, the Arab leaders, his father was big time Sufi leader in Egypt, um, they were celebrating the discovery at first because, oh look, our scripture's from God, this is a one true religion, you know how people get. But then Dr. Khalifa's like, hold on now, there's this matter of Hadith and Sunnah that God calls out by name in the Quran. You're following that instead of the Quran, and you got these two false verses that you will not part with. And your Shahada is hokey because you're mentioning Muhammad. Saudi Arabia <laughs> declared the 19 code haram, forbidden. His translation, Adip Yuxel's translation, Adip Yuxel's reformist translation, um, Adip wrote the, the Warmonger's Guide to Peace and other books. He's, he's an activist. He was uh, uh, one of Khalifa's pupils. His translation... Um, other literature pertaining to the 19 Code, and just this idea that Hadith and Sunnah has nothing to do with Islam. All that type of stuff is banned in Saudi Arabia and other so-called Muslim countries, because what Saudi says goes. Right, so um, this information emerges, and you'd think they'd be celebrating, and they were at first, until they weren't, because their idolatry was exposed. And who is this Dr. Rashad Khalifa man think he is? And so, um, you know, I'm not a Rashad Khalifa historian. I know his son. I know a lot of his contemporaries. Uh, met his widow once, years ago, at an ICS conference. Um, I don't think I've ever met his sister, uh, Sam's sister. But um, the message never changed. Um, I know just from all the media that he put out and all the writing, that man worked tirelessly. I've, I've been told that he hardly slept. Dr. Khalifa was assassinated here in Tucson on January 31st, 1990. He was stabbed to death in the, uh, the old masjid 
Um, his secretary, Lisa, found him. The family was informed that it was the Iranians, that um, that was who orchestrated the assassination. And they also attempted, and mind you, this is early 90s, so they also attempted to burn the research. The entire place was doused in gasoline. But something spooked the assailants off before they could strike a match. But the place was soaked in gasoline also. So it's, it's the research. It's the 19 code. It just, it strips Saudi Arabia of their self-proclaimed authority. God addresses this in the Quran. Do they think that because they are custodians of the Kaaba, that they own it? Or that they own Islam? What do you think happened to Dr. Khalifa? Well, here's what I know happened. Uh, he challenged the hypocrite agenda, pointed out their hypocrisies, supported by God's incontrovertible evidence, and he was martyred because of it. So, victory or martyrdom, either way he won. And did he call it the 19 code because the number 19 showed up in this code? Yes, 19, the number 19 was a common denominator. And you find uh, the number 19 and its multiples, 38, 57, 76, 95, or is it 94? Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm kind of sleep deprived. I'm not sleeping so well with my shoulder pain. But um, there are 19 multiples present in significant scientific discoveries, world events, Obviously, 19 9-11 hijackers, uh, 19 service members killed during Operation Red Wings, some of those whom I served with, um, 38 service members, 19 times 2, um, 38 service members um, killed in the extortion 17 situation. Um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, the number of bones we have in our body. Um, if you look at the table of elements, there's a Fibonacci flip, um, which I don't know if I've sent you, I probably sent you information regarding that, but God willing to put those links in the description. But um, this, 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 it's God's stamp on us. It's why 19? Uh, it's an odd number. It's the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, one and nine, it looks the same in all languages. Um, Dr. Khalifa has his um, has his appendices and introduction and footnotes and subtitles that help provide context and more information um, to this and um, that's not scripture though and that's within the international community of submitters that's the problem uh, some folks have taken to um, worshipping Dr. Khalifa by way of adhering to his side notes as if it were divine scripture, which it's not. Anyway, this, this 19 code, um, it serves to convince people that this is a divine scripture. It confirms previous scripture. It confirms the Bible. It confirms scriptures not limited to the Bible. Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary, that chunk of time missing from the Bible, the, that period of his life that is notably absent from the Bible, he was in like the Nepal area, like northern Air, uh, India, like up in that region, learning. And those scriptures are numerically coded as well. The philosophers and scientists and, you know, just public figures in general, people who... Um, are into science and spirituality and proving or disproving these things. The majority of them don't know about this code and the few that do, it's, they just kind of dismiss it as, I don't know what, unimportant. This is probably the most important scientific discovery maybe ever. This is, this, is, this is contact, like Carl Sagan variety contact. Absolutely. There's one race, the human race. We have different ethnicities, genetic makeup, culture, nationality. You know, these variables are all, they matter, but only in that they serve as a test. Are you going to adhere to the Quran or not? You're going to adhere to God's instruction or not? 
Is your culture going to get in the way of that? Are you going to continue on in cultural practices that may violate the scripture, but then claim that that's from scripture? Like people do this. All religions are corrupted. All of them. Islam too. Especially Islam. All of them. All religions are corrupted. So, yes, we have one creator. It is not a human. It has no human needs. It has no need to beget humans. We are directly responsible for our own salvation. God sends teachers here to guide us. God sends scriptures here to inform us. But we are responsible for our salvation. We and we alone. Only us. There is no intercession. That's a myth. Worshipping Jesus, worshipping Muhammad, worshipping the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, worshipping anything other than God, worshipping your dog, worshipping your job, your child, your looks, your bank account, whatever it is. If it's not God, you're wrong. So the devil's been very um, good at convincing people that not only does God and the devil not exist, but then the people who are still not ready to give up on that convincing them that there's this system of intercession. You don't really have to do anything other than believe that this person's going to save you. Or this thing is going to save But we are directly responsible for our deeds. Our creator is closer to us in our jugular vein. These are meat sack spacesuits. This is not me. You know, that is not you. We are souls housed in human bodies. We are not our bodies. Um, so when you get into like transcendental meditation and Kundalini and all these other, you know, like woo woo spiritual new age stuff, there's room for that in the Quran too. There's, there's evidence to support some of that doctrine too, but then that stuff has also been corrupted. So what this does is this provides us with the basic requirement for salvation and anything above that, it's, it's up to you. I mean, it's up to you anyway, but number one. Do you believe that there's a creator? Do you believe in God? Do you believe, whether you call it God or not, do you believe in something a greater than us that created us? Okay, that's the first criteria. Two, do you believe that there's something that will come after this? Do you believe that we're going to be judged and held to account and where we end up is directly proportionate to our deeds? And three, do you do your best to be a good person? Do your best to lead a righteous life? With, with the tools that you're given and, and in the circumstances you're, you're operating within. You do your best to be a good person, lead a righteous life. And we have the instructions in here for that. But not only that, we have um, this inherent um, instinct, this knowledge. Um, so this takes it, this strips it down to bare bones, spirituality and, and the root and the basis of all religions that all religions are built upon. You see fragments of these practices in all other religions. Um, not in their entirety, but you see fragments of it. And, and a lot of this has been lost because humans just stray. They're not satisfied. They get bored. They, someone comes up with something that looks flashy and new and let's try that instead. And this is old and stale and tales, you know, and this happens. Wash your rinse, repeat. Pick your religion. Pick your, pick your school of thought, your, your society. And, and, it, and it, it will continue. But what this does, it strips away ex exclusivity your way and my way may be similar yet dissimilar, but I don't hold the monopoly on God's grace, and neither do you. You don't have a hell to throw me in, nor are you. How do you feel about that debate you had with your grandma? No. <clears throat> well, I was rude. <laughs> I was rude. I was rebellious, though. I, I was a rebellious kid. Um, but that was rude. That was rude. To quote Trent Reznor, your God is dead and no one cares. If there's a hell, I'll see you there. That's rude. That's just rude. Um, we've since had a discussion since then, like me as an adult um, and as a Muslim, uh, speaking to my Jehovah's Witness grandmother, um, finding we have more in common than, than I ever thought we would. Um, I still feel the same. <laughs> I still feel the same because if no one ever hears or reads the Quran or no one ever tells them about that or the Bible or the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita or any, any other, you know, religious text, scripture, whatever, um, 
That doesn't mean they're booked for hell. That doesn't mean they're not guided. Abraham, Abraham, the prophet Abraham, didn't have a scripture. Neither did Adam. They were looking up at the sky at the celestial bodies and wondering, is this my God? No, because eventually they set as they turn on the celestial sphere. So um, always searching for something outside of themselves. They didn't have a scripture, but they had that inherent wisdom, that knowledge that there is something outside of themselves greater than even the earth that they inhabit. Um, so none of us have an excuse. None of us have an excuse. We all have mitigating circumstances and God knows what those are. But no one has an excuse. God knows your belief even better than you do. There are times I question myself. <laughs> um, know that God is one. Know that God is not government. There's only one God. And to that we submit. Mm -hmm.